I would just want to kind of talk about what happened with, in my case. Um, I'm at high school, um, chasing girls and having fast cars and not paying any attention to what's going on in the world. And then I get my draft notice and I'm off. Uh, I'm out of high school within six months. Um, I've got my final draft notice. Uh, get up in the morning at five o'clock and go to the Red Cross station or, um, and get on, go to Detroit. We end up going to Fort Wayne in Detroit. That was the induction center. Uh, go through, I think it was probably a day and a half worth of, of physical and mental tests and we were off. Uh, I, we had a plane load of guys from Michigan that went to Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Um, Camp Bell was full. Um, I forget what the other base was right up there. Fort Knox, I think it was, and they were full, so we ended up going to Fort Bragg in North Carolina. Um, so it was just a group of us Michigan guys with a bunch of Southern guys and sweet tea all the time. Just something you, we hadn't experienced up here. But uh, everybody knew what was what we were there for. We went through basic training. It was eight weeks, and then they put up a posted on the on the board where everybody was going. Um, all but two of us uh, ended up in Vietnam. Uh, two guys uh, uh, went to uh, Steve Woodard and Don Wilhelm went to Alaska as engineers. Um, uh, Steve bunked beside me and Don bunked above me. Don was from Petoskey. Um, his father was in construction and he was a ski instructor in the wintertime. And uh, he was always upset about the fact that, you know, we knew where we were going and, you know, he was, it was really bothered by all this. Uh, long story, but he, when I got back, I ran into Steve and he said, well, you know what happened to Don? And, and I said, no. And he uh, had bought a new car, came home on leave back to Petoskey and bought a new El Camino and went back up to Alaska and was hit by a train. So <clears throat> it's a weird world. It's uh, that's just one of, <clears throat> one of the things that sticks in my heart. Anyway, we ended up going from there to a bus ride up to Fort Dix for our AIT. Again, they call it advanced individual training, which was definitely advanced individual training or infantry training. And we spent eight weeks up there. Um, we'd fly home to Michigan every weekend. I still have the, the plane tickets from flying home. It was $16.50 to, to fly one, one way from Philadelphia. So we flew back and forth every weekend. Everybody, you know, you get back and you sit and drink beer and then after that, we got a 30-day leave, um, got on a plane, went to Fort Lewis, um, processed through Fort Lewis, we had a 22-hour trip to, to Vietnam. We think we made around three trips, or three stops on the way. Then we came into Cameron Bay, and you get off this airplane, and the place just stinks. I mean, it's hot, and it stinks like a garbage pit. And it, it's... Uh, just hits you right in the face. I mean, not just the not just the temperature, but the smell, and it was it was just obnoxious. Uh, then, from there, we went up to uh, Benoit on a, a bus. You get on a bus, and it has wire grates over the windows, so as you're going through the town or village or whatever, somebody couldn't toss something inside. Uh, get to that place, and that then you have a week of of certs, which is getting you familiarized with what, what the Army life was like in Vietnam and what you were doing. You'd go out on, uh, they put you out on a bunker at night to pull bunker guard. You spent a week doing that. You, everybody took this silly picture. I don't know if you guys that were there, if you had that picture taken where there's a, a picture of you with a helmet and then the small picture in, in the inset and you sent it home. And between that and you bought a Bible. Everybody bought a Bible, had their family name imprinted in it, and sent home. Uh, so I went from there, got on a, got on a plane, and went up to Camp Evans 
up in Northern i -Corps. And checked in there, got all my equipment. They told me, go out, sit on the chopper pad. Uh, we have a helicopter going out to take mail and, and supplies out to the out to Firebase Birch's Garden, which was in the Ashaw Valley. 101st named their fire bases after World War II battles. So this was Birch's Garden. Uh, I waited there three days, finally got, got on a helicopter and got out there. And it's, it's kind of, well, you're right in the middle of a jungle on top of a mountain. There was a, a two mountain tops and a saddle in between. And we had our, I was in mortars and we had our, our side of the mountain. And then and the, on the, the saddle was a helicopter chopper pad. And on the other top, the other mountain top was artillery. And so you get into your pit and we had three mortar tubes on our side of the mountain. There was one at, at the, almost to the top, then one halfway down and one at the, where the chopper pads came in. And the, the mortar pit at the bottom by the chopper pads, we just used for illumination. So that was all filled with just illumination rounds. The other two had HE round, high explosive rounds in, in that, in their pits. So the, I'm there probably two weeks and every, every night we'd have a mad minute, which everybody would fire everything they had outside the, the perimeter. So if you had grenades, you'd throw grenades out there. We fired mortars out there. We'd fire them up at a zero charge, which means that they're lowest, the lowest height they could get, the, the less charge to shoot at the, the mortar up. And we'd fire it almost straight up, and you could watch, the, watch it go up, and then it would kind of wiggle like this and fall over and come down. And the side of our pit, we were on this mountain, and it was just dropped right off. So 19 and terribly stupid, we would try to catch them, <laughs> which if it didn't rip your hand off, if you did get anywhere near it, it might have blown up, who knows. But that was, I mean, 19, we're not very bright. <laughs> I mean, we're in the Army. Okay, that was number one thing. Uh, so we have a mad minute. We'd have a mad minute every night. And then we'd go and sit on the bunker, bunker line on the outside of the perimeter, or on the perimeter, and Curahee was in the valley it was a fire base, and it was like the 4th of July every night. Green tracers coming in and red tracers going out, flares, and then they'd bring in the gunships, and it was just, everything was lit up. I mean, it was the best 4th of July you can ever imagine. But these guys are getting their behinds kicked. So that was the norm for out there, and then when that got over with, you'd go back to the, well, we'd go back to the pit and either play mumbly pegs or, or pay, play cards or something. Or go, you know, the other guys would go to the hooch or do go about their business, whatever they needed to, to have done. So, one night, they had the bright idea that we're going to have a mad minute, and then maybe 10 or 15 minutes later, we're going to have another mad minute. So, we had our mad minute. Everybody went out. We're watching for Kerr. He did get lit up. Never happened. So everybody's all kind of bummed out. And, you know, we're headed back to the to the hooch and whatever we're going to do, and. Uh, start playing our cards or whatever, and, and they call and say, we're gonna have a, the second mad minute. So everybody gets up, back out, we're firing our mortars and throwing grenades and having a really, you know, just fun time as usual. Well, all of a sudden we're getting shot back at. The gooks, instead of hitting Kurahi that night, came up to get us. So they come up through where the, there was a valley at the one, at the, the saddle where the saddle met the mountain, and that was our garbage dump. So the trash and everything like that was in there. And they started, they came up through there. Um, they, we were getting mortared in a kind of Z fashion down the hill and knocked off our top gun. And so two guys and the whole gun was just destroyed. But uh, so then we had to do something different. So. I was taken from my gun and grabbing rounds out of that, that gun pit and running them down to the illumination pit to fire the high explosive rounds to get the, you know, get back, have the gun back in action. And I've made about six trips up and down that hill. And it was, they had, we had ammo boxes stacked up. This is kind of a walkway. 
and of course the ammo pit was here sandbagged and, and bunk you know ammo boxes and I'm running up and down about my sixth trip up I came down with a four or five rounds dropped him and Lyman Bennett who I'd gone through basic and AIT with um, he was cutting the charges and getting them ready for me to fire and setting the gun up so I could come down and fire and that last trip I started running back up somebody tripped me grabbed my leg and I fell hard on, the, on those boxes and I was mad I couldn't understand why anybody would do that and uh, I turned around and, you know look what what the heck are you doing what did you do that for he says well you can't you can't do that he says every time you run up that hill they're shooting at you and probably because of him I'm here today that was I'm, I'm talking I got maybe a month in country now so this is a very poor in my mind this is a pretty poor start to a year in Vietnam I mean we've getting you know I'm not there you know maybe a month and I'm getting overrun we're getting overrun um, we had 37 bodies inside the wire and after that they, we just kind of they were trying to get the artillery uh, our artillery captain was shot three times, but nothing, you know, serious. I mean, serious to get shot, but um, he was he was alive. Um, so then they pulled us off. The monsoons were coming into the valley, into the mountains, so you couldn't get helicopters in, you couldn't get resupplied. So they pulled us off, and we went back to the rear. Um, went to Eagle Beach for a week, and then we took off. It, came back up for uh, what they called uh, P training, and that was just to remind us or tell us who was working in our area, what kind of trips, what kind of uh, booby traps they were using, what equipment they had, and back out we went. So we went up to the north, took over for the Marines up the DMZ for a while, went to Camp Carroll, which the 101st renamed at Camp Scotch, and I forever were looking to find out, I knew I was on a place called Scotch, I finally found it in a, in a book, uh, but it was always Camp Carroll. We ended up from Camp Carroll going to uh, Razorback Ridge up on the DMZ in the, in the rock pile while the Marines pulled out. The Arvins took over. When that was complete, back out to the valley we went. We went to a fire base called Jack, and that was on the edge of the mountains, and that was just to kind of leapfrog into the valley. They were getting ready to go back on top of Ripcord. Um, the last few things I've read on Ripcord, everybody seems to say that it's taken, it was a three day bat or a 23 day battle. We started up the mountain in March and we're basically run off of it in July 23rd. Uh, wow. When I got to Ripcord, like again, we were just beginning to build the thing. And we were being, wow, we were being shot at and mortared and rocketed uh, every day. Didn't make any difference, day or night. I had built my, my hooch underneath the chopper pad, thinking that 19, no experience in, in, in this kind of thing, in engineering, uh, thinking that the steel chopper pad was a great roof on my hooch. Yeah, well, that was... It was a great roof, all right, but every time a chopper came in, they mortared it. So they tore up the whole, you know, all the sandbags. Uh, I had a really nice roof I made out of sandbags, and uh, that's all gone. It was just dirt. Um, the other thing we could do is we could stand in the door to my hooch from the, from the, uh, my mortar pit was out here, and the door to my hooch was here, and this, this was the chopper pad at this point. And I could stand here, and when the choppers came in, I mean, we had Hueys or um, Chinooks come in, and you could just stand there and watch the green tracers rip down the side of it. But because of the angle that we were at going down the mountain, when they were firing from across, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't hit us because our, our pit wall was just high enough, the angle was right. I mean, they just went over your head. And we, you'd stand there and you'd watch this, this uh, pop, pop, pop down the side of a Chinook and the green tracers coming in, the holes, and then it just sh kind of shuddered and sat down. At one point they tried to, they thought they could take it apart. So they brought in another Chinook and put a sling down 
and hooked it to the, the front rotors and guys jumped up on top of it and hooked, hooked it to the, those rotors and the, the, the other Chinook took off and this uh, set of four blades is flying around behind it and he's hauling back and we were watching him and the whole time he's going, the rotor's in the back doing this and it's on a, a, a nylon strap. So the nylon strap is just winding itself right up and it keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter coming up on the back of this Chinook. And you can see the guy, the, the guy that's on the, they got the gate open and they got a, a 60 machine gun sitting there. The guy's laying right there and he's watching it coming <laughs> and it's, it's starting to come right into his face. And you can just see he's just screaming, you know, you know trying to get him to do something about this. It's gonna, it's gonna get him. So moments later, the Chinook did this and the strap, they let go of the strap and that blade went right up around and over the top of them, almost came back to the, to the ripcord, and it was just floating through the air. But that was one of the good experiences from the from ripcord. I spent some time with, uh, with Alpha Company, with Chris's, not knowing Chris's father, um, my squad, which would normally be five or six people, there was three of us. So we were, would be up come to different Units. So we went out with Alpha Company, with Chuck Hawkins. Uh, just depend upon who wanted you, what they, who needed you. We were so short on people that um, it was it was impossible to get a full squad for anybody. These guys were, you know, going out, and we were just always short. Uh, my three guys, we'd either take a M60, or we take the. At one point with uh, Alpha Company, we'd haul for Chuck Hawkins. We'd haul the mortar out with him, and. I, they didn't like that too much because everybody had to carry an extra mortar around, which is a, you know another 20 pounds or so. And uh, at the in when we weren't out with them, we'd be back at Ripcord, and again we were getting we were getting hit all the time. Uh, it was at a time that Nixon had stopped the bombing, and the Arvins were left, the DMZ and uh, the North Vietnamese were just coming through. And, in herds, I mean, it's just unbelievable. You could, you could, uh, you could hear the trucks coming down through the valley. I mean, you could, all the sounds and all these flashlights. I mean, they were had had flashlights going. They didn't care, and uh, they were just out to see how many they they could get. But I think I'll give it off to Chris here because I'm kind of. The I guess the one thing I want to see about Chris's book before I, I do give it up here is, I've read a lot, I got a ton of books. I got a ton of books, I read them all the time. I, you can ask my wife if you know, she wants to talk to me and I'm sitting there reading a book. But I always had this one favorite book and it was called Life in a Year. And I've had that, I don't know, it came out a long time ago. And I've always had that, I've, I got, I've got, uh, Nolan's books, and then I got uh, Ben Harrison's books, and then they kept talking that Chris was writing a book. And I thought, you know, uh, if it's like the other ones, it's, it, can't top, it can't top the one to begin with. But, um, and then I got a hold of it, and boy, was I wrong. Uh, Chris, Chris hit the money, right? Uh, I just can't see enough of them. Um, this is actually about us. This was us. I mean, my wife has always been after me to write a book, and uh, I, I, I can't do it. But Chris did it. Chris got these guys and got, got all the right information. He didn't get all, it wasn't all BS. You know, I've read the other ones, and they're just kind of, they're not about us. It wasn't about us and what we did and what we had to go through. Um, it's very impressive. I recommend it to uh, everyone. And uh, I think it'll go a long ways, I'm hoping. I buy, I'd buy it by the case. <laughs> Thank you.
Brenda Sprader. Facing serious legal problems alone can be disappointing and stressful. When your freedom, your loved ones, or your finances are at stake, it is important to seek legal representation. I'm an experienced trial attorney and will work hard to protect what is important to you. I strive for equitable resolution and provide confidential guidance. I cannot promise specific results, but I do promise to be committed to zealously fighting to ensure that your rights are protected and that justice is served. If you would like to meet with me to discuss your legal issues, please call the number on your screen for a free consultation. At Bowman's Body Shop, we're proud to say you're driving home our reputation. Our team of highly skilled professionals uses the latest high-tech equipment to diagnose the extent of the damage to your vehicle. Bowman's Body Shop, 2846 Getty Street in Muskegon. For years, people have put together photo collages for special occasions. They go through the photo album and old shoe boxes and pull out their favorite photos and put them on poster boards. The boards are a great way of sharing stories, but it can be a pretty tedious job. Well, we here at Clocks, we want to make that job easier for you. So just bring us all the photos and we'll scan them into the computer and then we'll print out the collages on our large format printer. That way, all the photos will be in digital format so you can share them with your friends and relatives.